Okay, so this morning we're going to introduce um, spot colors. And I know I don't usually tape this, but there's a lot of new concepts to work with here. And um, how many people are new to Illustrator? Never used Illustrator before? Raise your hands really high because it's hard for me to see up here. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're going to work with two concepts that are new to most of you. And if, you could, if I could have your attention up here, I'd appreciate it. And even though you have a ton of homework to do, I would love for you to focus your, your view up here. Thank you so much. Okay, so one of the things I want to talk about right here is about spot colors. Did I show you this video? You did. I did, okay. And we talked about spot colors and spot inks. Um, yes, I, did I go through this whole thing? I did. Oh, man, I'm a step ahead. All right. And um, so we talked about colors and tints? No. Okay. All right, let me open this cabinet up here and turn on the lights just for a second. So spot colors. Um, did I take this book out? I think I did. Oh, I think you did because Tracy showed it to you. Okay. So spot colors are, is that can of ink where you literally are mixing ink that goes in the press. Good morning, Zoe. Um, and this is a, I said good morning. Good morning. And um, so this is a swatch book for using spot colors, cans, <laughs> cans of ink. Oh, did you bring your puppy? Oh, God, I got to <laughs> Zach, you didn't say a word. So what I want to show you is the swatch book again. So this is a Pantone matching system swatch book. Pantone matching system, known as PMS, is a international company that creates a formula for mixing inks. And it's international because you could go anywhere around the world and specify a PMS number that you would find in one of these books and universally everybody would know exactly what it is you were talking about. So there are two different books. There's one that's called Pantone Coded and there's one that's called Pantone, there, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that, Pantone Solid, that's your keyword here, Solid Coded, and Pantone Solid Uncoded. There is absolutely no difference in the ink. The swatch books just demonstrate to you what the ink looks like on coated paper compared to the ink on uncoated paper. So I'm going to pass these together as a pair so you can find an ink number and see how the color varies depending on the paper stock. And you're going to specify as a designer, it's your job to specify an ink color. And in the software we use, Illustrator and InDesign and Photoshop, you can specify Pantone solid coated colors or Pantone solid uncoated colors and they're going to look different on your screen because your screen is not made up of ink which is why you use a swatch book because when you print something you're going to really want to know what the ink looks like on paper so <clears throat> let me turn off the lights and point out to you that when you print something um, spot colors are also referred to as flat colors, and it used to be referred to as a flat color because the appearance of just a flat, solid area of color was what spot colors would generate, but now I think it's a misnomer. Personally, I think it's a misnomer because um, in Illustrator, you can do so much stuff that makes things three-dimensional looking that you create the illusion of dimensionality, so the word flat is deceiving. Okay, But when you use a spot color, the way that you vary the ink color is through tinting the color. So most of you have already applied this in your use in InDesign, where you select a color and then you change the value of it to a different tint. And for a spot color, the, what happens when you change the value to a different tint isn't that the color becomes lighter and they add white to it. What happens is, is they break the color down, the solid color, um, into dots. And these dots, depending on the size of them and how close together they are, determines the illusion of a lighter color, a tint. And um, 
that's what you end up manipulating to create different values of color. Now there's something that's going to get you into trouble when you start working with spot colors and I want you to look on the screen behind me. Um, what gets you into trouble with spot colors is naming and what I mean by that is you have a computer and you specify a spot color. So you specify that you want to use, if you're looking at the Pantone book, you specify that you want to use um, Pantone 185, which is a red. And you're going to have to choose when you pick Pantone 185. You're going to have to pick either Pantone 185C, Pantone with an E, Pantone 185U, or Pantone 185, I think it's CVC. And the C stands for coded, the U stands for uncoded, and frankly, I don't even remember what CVC stands for. Uh, computer video coded. And um, it's just how color is displayed. But the can of ink, these three colors, because this, you know, video, the word video just makes this out of my vocabulary, okay? But, um, but the C and the U is still the same can of ink. Doesn't matter, same can of ink. But what happens is, is when you set up your computer um, and you specify a spot color, and I'll show you why they call it spot, um, make sure that you don't make the mistake and accidentally select both C and U because the computer sees it as two different inks. You say, well, they're both 185. No, the computer says no, it's 185C. And then a second color, 185U. And what gets you into trouble is when you build your graphic files, the computer thinks you have two colors of ink when your intention is to use only 185. Okay? And it'll become clear for you when, when we set up the files. I'll show you. What was your question, Crystal? I was going to be that where, how do these, how does the, how does the print shop know that these are the colors that you selected? I'll show you. Okay. We're going to do that and when, when, when I demo your exercise, mm -hmm. you'll see it. Okay. It'll be real clear. I just want you to understand what the inks are. Can of ink, pick a swatch. That's what you need to know. And then be consistent in that swatch name. Okay? And let me turn off the lights one more time. Oh. All right. Let's see. So we've talked about Pantone swatch books. Now, you could set up a file, for example, as grayscale, black ink only. And on your computer screen, you're only going to see it as black ink. But um, you can at the print shop. David, you with me here? OK. Um, at the print shop, um, you could tell the printer, you can say, oh, I don't want to print with black ink. Can you just put Pantone 185 instead? Your art file is set up as black. doesn't matter. They're going to generate a printing plate. The printing plate doesn't have ink on it. The print <coughs> equipment will get ink in it. This is for offset printing, not digital. And um, so they can put purple ink, green ink, yellow ink, doesn't matter. Just switch out your inks, right? You're still creating a one color document. Um, most commonly, when you want a lot of wow in a design, particularly when you're doing logos, often you'll want to use two colors of ink because most printing presses there are many printing presses. It's not much more money for you to print with a two-color print press. Not a lot of money, but you get a lot of wow for it. And then if you're mixing two colors, you're mixing two color tints, um, you can get a huge variety of colors, which I'll demonstrate for you today. So it's to your advantage to know how to work with two ink colors instead of just assuming everything in the world is full color, process color. Because two ink colors can generate all kinds of beautiful designs. So, <clears throat> and logos, oh, little puppy sounds. <laughs> so can you imagine listening to this video? Oh, little puppy sounds. They think this woman's like hallucinating, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so that's so much for spot colors. Any, co any questions besides what you had about spot colors? All righty. 
Then let's now move to talk about vector graphics versus um, raster graphics. Vector graphics are created through something called Bezier curves. And what you're looking at here on the screen are anchor points that are created through XY coordinates, which means, let's say this little anchor point's at the one inch mark, <coughs> both vertically and horizontally, and this one might be at the one inch and a quarter mark uh, vertically and horizontally, it's still at the one inch mark. You follow that? Mm -hmm. And it it's like playing dot to dot. Connecting those dots is what Bezier curves is about. It's just a mathematical equation and um, a definition of a curve. And these Bezier curves, this mathematical equation, is um, how vector graphics are created. And so when you create vector artwork, there's a huge advantage to it. When you create a raster image, let me see if there's a, no, there's not. No, not in here. Okay. When you create a raster image, which is a photograph, I was looking for an example of it, but there's not one here. When you create a photograph, it's filled with pixels, and every pixel has to be defined. But in a vector graphic, you're creating these mathematical equations for each anchor point. You're not defining pixels on a page. So your file size is much smaller, much smaller. The other advantage of creating Bezier curves, vector graphics, is that it can be sized up or sized down, which is called resolution independent, which is a key word on your final, resolution independent. Just put that in your brain. Vector graphics are resolution independent, which means they can size up or size down, and the resolution, the quality of the file, never changes. If you blow it up a vector graphic to the size of a building, doesn't matter because it's resolution independent and it can grow exponentially. The file size stays the same. All you're doing is multiplying it by a certain percentage. It's a mathematical equation. And the quality of your image is high resolution. Okay? Can you follow that? Um, so the advantages of a vector graphic is it's resolution independent. You have a small file size, and you can resize it without losing quality. Um, and this is a little sophisticated here. The disadvantages of a vector graphic is it's really it's a PostScript file. PostScript is a page description language. So if you were to print an Illustrator file to a printer directly, a native Illustrator file to a printer directly, it wouldn't know what to do with it unless it had something called RAM. Those are PostScript laser printers. They have RAM. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. It's essentially a brain. What makes your computer itself work, the the, not the speed of your computer, but how, much, how many tasks your computer can do simultaneously, kind of like our own brains, how much we can do simultaneously, um, is the random access memory. If you have a lot of RAM, you can do many ta tasks simultaneously. So when you have um, a PostScript file, you need to have RAM to interpret it, because the RAM contains the PostScript language and can output your file. Now, that's a disadvantage of having Illustrator. However, all of you know the answer to this, all of you, if you think about it for a moment. If you don't have um, a printer that has RAM and PostScript built into your printer, how could you output an Illustrator file without needing RAM or the page description language, the PostScript language? Oh, Stephen, you get the A plus for today besides Zach with the dog. Um, yes, that's exactly accurate. Convert your file to a PDF and your printer can handle a PDF because the PDF embeds that PostScript language into the file. So you have no problem with it. So it's not really a disadvantage anymore, is it? Okay, so any questions about a vector graphic, what a vector graphic is? No? I think I explained that well then. All right, let's see what else we got here. Designing, we did that. All right. Spot colors, we did that. 
uh, vector raster did that. Um, these links here are for when you step away from class and you want to know how to work in Illustrator and spot colors and specify them, which I will demo to you. These are links that will teach you exactly what is I'm going to demo to you today. But they're available online. So these three links are how to create Pantone colors in Illustrator, how to create Pantone colors in InDesign, and then how to print color separations. And I'm not going to get into the separations for the moment. Okay, so we kind of nailed that lecture. So are there any questions on any of that for the moment? Okay, then what I'd like to do is talk about your next assignment, which I'm going to demo for you um, so you understand what to do. <clears throat> and there's a lot going on on this page, a lot more than you're accustomed to with the chapter work, because we're you're going to be reading chapter 12 and you're going to work in the book in chapter 12 and do the exercises in there. What you're going to end up doing for a submission here, um, oh, also, you're going to read through the color modes lecture again. Remember where we talk about ink colors? All righty. Um, so there, I've created this tutorial page here. I've jumped down a little, skipped a link. And here is a tutorial, basically what I'm demoing today is what this is. It's last semester's class video on this assignment, demoing spot colors. Here's a tutorial on um, spot colors, um, also on working with clip art, and same thing here. And then um, this is a link on how to troubleshoot spot colors, not done, oh no, this is not done by me. This is where I think I pulled up a student's assignment that wasn't done properly and I show you how to correct it. So I'm going to let you watch that on your own. And then I'm going to demo something today called mixed color swatches. Oh, that is me again. Okay, there's something cool about mixed color swatches and that's an InDesign I'll show you. So again, this link has lots of support material for you. And then this is a text wrap. Um, oh, it's me again. You're stuck with me. Um, and it's a text wrap demo. Okay? And that's from semesters past, not from this semester. And then how to access this assignment. There's two ways you access this assignment. Um, through this link here, Adobe Illustrator Spot Color Clip Art Assignment, which is what you submit. And there's going to be links that you're required to work with. And since it's not in the Artwork and Resources folder, you can download them right here. So you click on Links. And there's a zipped folder. So you'll save the zipped file, I should say. And it'll put that wherever your computer places it. My computer places it in uh, Downloads folder. So when I open the Downloads folder and I come here to um, what I downloaded today. It'll be the clip art assignment. And I'm just going to drag it to the desktop so we can find it easily. And then you double click on it and the folder is going to open. And um, I don't want to put that back in there. Let's look um, at what's in the folder. There's two text files. That'll be the text you'll use in the assignment because you can go to File Place, right? Command D and place text in a text box. <clears throat> and you're going to work with two different graphics. One is a chicken graphic and one is a skunk graphic. And so what I'd like to demo for you right now today is how to work in Illustrator, how to add spot colors, how to kind of create a streamline workflow, and um, how to troubleshoot some of the areas that we kind of fall into that are problems. So basically this assignment tells you that you're going to work with these two Illustrator files. They're clip art. Clip art means that it's like stock photography. You could go to any stock photography or stock website, stock image website, and specify downloading a vector graphic. And you would have a graphic, a vector graphic, that means you would have a graphic that you'd be able to open in Illustrator. And sometimes they're built in kind of a complicated way. Um, so you kind of have to know how to troubleshoot it. And I'm going to walk you through it. The other thing is, um, I've looked at this chicken and this skunk for a really long time. So kind of like the first chapter that you had in the book where you had to draw a robot on a tic-tac-toe board, um, you must work with a skunk and you must work with a chicken. Skunk is on one page, two colors, two spot colors. 
The chicken will be on another page, two spot colors, but give me a good smile on my face when you design it because, you know, have fun with it. This is really your first project where there is no template. You're, you're building the entire thing yourself. You're working with the graphics yourself. You're working with the text. You are working with the text provided. The text has built-in typos, um, erroneous symbols, um, so you got to read it. You can't just spell check it because spell checking it won't take care of business. You got to read it. So um, let's let's start working with the files that we downloaded. All of the instructions are here, and then of course there are many more Illustrator support resources because again this class is taught online, so they don't have a narrative to walk them through. So everything you need in terms of instruction is here. And I recommend that you take a look at the score sheet. There is a score sheet just like in the book um, that I've done for the chapter work. And look at the score sheet carefully to make sure that you've set up your files properly and how to troubleshoot it. So let's, let's just get started. Launch Illustrator. And how many people have never seen the Illustrator workplace before? Okay, here's the Illustrator workspace. And it looks very similar to InDesign, except CS6 now everything's this deep gray. Although I did find a way in preferences to change the color from deep gray to light gray, which oh, good. calms me down. Because deep gray looks like kind of I'm on the Star Wars death ship. <laughs> and um, so let's actually see if I can find it. Um, everything's always in preferences. So let's just start with general and see what shows up. And... Uh, not grid, color. What's appearance of black? Oh, appearance of black. We talked about appearance of black the other day. Appearance of the black is rich black and not, and just 100% black. That's what appearance of black is. So you can control it here. But I don't want to digress too much. I want to stay with where we're at. Uh, the user user face, probably. One above. Here we are. Canvas Thank you. Color. I feel so much better now. What do you think? It's just easier to see. Is it easier for you too? It is. Yeah. You know what? Thanks for saying that. How light should we go? It's good. Yeah. Yeah. I feel better about it. You know it's going to go back to the default later. But anyway, so here's our workspace. And what I recommend you do, don't make this mistake. If I if I go to this folder here where the chicken is and I double click on it. You're, if you're on a Mac, your computer might default to open it in preview. Don't do that. You'll get yourself into a cul-de-sac and never get out. Um, so what I recommend you do instead is take your file and open it through Illustrator. So I just dragged it to the Illustrator icon. Now if you've never seen a vector graphic, vector graphics are interesting. You can view them in outline mode and that's what makes up a vector graphic. Just these vector points. Because if I use my selection tool, the black arrow, like an InDesign, and I marquee this, and I zoom in here using the zoom tool, like an InDesign, you'll see that my vector points um, define my shapes, like the little triangles. So um, here's our vector graphic. Now, one of the things I recommend, and I'm going back to view preview, one of the things I want you to understand is if I click on it, it's grouped. Notice how everything became active. And vector graphics are created through shapes, closed shapes. And you fill the closed shape with a color. Kind of like when you were playing around in InDesign and drawing boxes and filling them with colors or something like that. So <clears throat> the best thing to do when you work with this is to select it and go to Object and ungroup it. And then click off of it to deactivate it and then see if it's still grouped. Sometimes they're still grouped. But right now if I hit Command-0 and zoom out, you'll see that my chicken is made up of a bunch of random shapes. Everything is a shape. as I'm just pulling them apart. And that's how it's built. So different shapes sit on top of other shapes. Okay, you get the idea? That's the wing. And that's how it's created. So your job in this project is to convert this full color, this full color chicken. So let me go to um, revert to saved, file revert. It'll put it back to the file I opened. 
um, your job in this assignment is to convert it to a two-color design because right now if you go to object ungroup there is something in Illustrator which I suggest that you learn immediately, which is under Window. You're going to want to open something called Separation Preview. Because right now, you'll notice that if I select my artwork here and I go to Overview Preview, that this artwork is built through Process Color. And you can never turn off all the colors. Something's always going to exist but it's built with CMYK. And you're gonna, your job is to make sure that it's converted to two spot colors. Did it go over there to you, Jamie? Yeah. Okay. And um, the way you're gonna pull up spot colors is this. You go to Window, you go to Swatch Library, and we just looked at the color books, the Pantone color books, so we go to color books, and then we find the word we wanna work with, the type of color, which I always work with Pantone solid coded. And if you just stay consistent, nothing's going to vary whether it's solid or, un, or I mean, coded or uncoded. But what is <coughs> critical is that the word solid's there because that makes it a spot color. So you select Pantone solid coded, and then you get this entire library in little swatches of what you just viewed in these color books. So you could open a color book and say, I want this one, look at the number, and select it. So I can say I want green, I can't read in the dark, but let's see if it's 3278. And I can type 3278, and it's going to become highlighted here. I find it hard to see in these little swatches, so I can use my pull-out menu. And I can list, um, I can go by list view instead, which gives me the little swatch and the number. And that way I can find 3278. And what happens is if I open my swatch panel by clicking on it in InDesign and I double click on the swatch right here, it adds that swatch to my swatch library here. And notice it turned everything because that was active. I didn't want to do that. It turned everything that color. So let me hit undo. Turn, deselect that and I'll double click and I added my swatch. And when I work with these, I end up working with dark color swatches because they're stronger. And then I might scroll through and pick something that's a complementary color because you can get a lot of wow when you mix complementary colors. And let me just pick this red. And then so you don't accidentally pick another swatch, I recommend you close this window because you're going to get yourself into trouble otherwise. You'll accidentally pick another swatch and add too many colors to your artwork. And now you've added two colors, so I would immediately save my file. And I'm going to save it as... Um, I put my name, and you might just to remember put your swatch colors, your spot colors. So what do I have? I have 3278, and I have 193. So you, just for your reference, you might say chicken uh, 3278, 193, and that might be the way you choose to name it for yourself. Can you show us again? I will do that. I will absolutely do that. And I'm going to save this in that clip art assignment folder. What would you pull out you used? Um, the pullout I used here, it comes in many locations. Swatch library, color books, Pantone solid coded. But you can also, I believe, go to the swatch panel and go to open swatch library, color books, Pantone solid coded. It's another way to get there. There's always many ways to get there, right, as we know. And just like in InDesign, if you don't know what the heck you're doing, go to Window. Right? That's where you find most everything. All right. So now we've got our colors selected. Now we're going to want to create this artwork. I'm going to put my separation preview over in the panel, which nests just like in InDesign. And what we do want to do is add a bunch of tints to this. And there's a variety of ways we can do it. We can go to Window, Color and open the color panel and we can use the slider bar and change our 193 tint to 59 percent and we could just drag the swatch and add it there. We can also do something like this. I can highlight the full solid um, swatch and there's something called color guide in um, Illustrator and the thing that color guide gives you is notice the difference between a spot color and not a spot color. 
Spot colors have, yes, they have spots in the corner. And that means that it's a spot color. Now, here's where I want you to see a little pit hole you might fall into. I can select this swatch right here, which is an 80% tint. Here's a 60, 40, 20. The color guide gives us all of those, but it also gives us the solid again. Let me drag, let me highlight, hold my shift key down, and take these four, 80, 60, 40% tints, and add them to my swatches so I can work with them. Right? I've created this whole library of tints now. But look what happens. This is my solid 193C for coded. But if I take this one and I add it here also, look what happens. I have a second 193C2, which means I now have it twice, <coughs> which means the computer is going to see that I have ink swatches called 193 and 193C2. And it's going to see it as a separate ink color. So you don't want it. Don't make that mistake. So don't duplicate colors. Basically. Don't duplicate the 100% color. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to put that baby in the trash so I don't accidentally use it. All right? Then I can go to my green swatch here. I can grab everything except the one that's at 100%. This is the one on the color guide box. That's at 100%. So I'm going to grab this one, hold my shift key down, and grab all of these tints and drag it in. And now I've got a whole bunch of tints to work with. And if I want a super light tint, I can even eye drop a light tint, like 9%, and drag it in there. I can also, like in InDesign, open a gradient tool. And the gradient works like InDesign, where I can drag my, let me do it with pretty tints. I can drag my tint of pink here. And I can drag a tint of green here. And I can move my white slider here and I can get rid of black because black's a color. I don't want to use it, so I yank it off. And now I've got a gradient using only spot colors, and I can drag my gradient swatch to my swatch panel also. Wow. It's a wow. <laughs> I can also change my gradient to radial, like a sun, and I can drag that to my gradient panel also. And I can go back to my vertical gradient swatch, which I'm not naming. I can name it. And I can change the angle of my gradient, so watch my stripes change. And my stripes are now going to be horizontal, not vertical. And I can drag that because they're going to rotate 90 degrees when I place them, although it doesn't show in the box here. Um, so now my goal, let me close that all up. I've got a bunch of swatches, so again, save your file. Since I saved it and named it, I just can save over where I was. Yes. And now what I'm going to do is click on the chicken and make sure it's ungrouped and zoom in and start to realize how it's built. Remember, it's built with shapes on top of shapes. And keep your swatch panel close. Don't make the mistake of using these swatches, so close your color guide now that you've used all the wonderful things it does. And you can, for example, I can use my black arrow, my selection tool, and I can just start changing colors. I can click on things and make them active, and I can start changing colors. Now, you know, John always has those little shortcuts for you, right? You can also, I can take this stripe of green from my field, hold my shift key down, select them all, and now they're all selected, and I can convert that, for example, um, let me go back to my color window. I can convert that, for example, to white, White's okay to use, right? Don't use black, though. And the other thing, there's another shortcut, which is this. Like, for example, I can click on this blue color, and I can go to Select Object, no, excuse me, Select Same Fill Color, and it's going to select everything that is that blue color, and I can now universally change it by clicking on the swatch. I can click on the orange right there on that door, now the door is set up, it's not two triangles, it's a rectangle with a white bar across it, right? So I can select the orange and I can now go to same fill color and I can change that to dark green. 
And the goal is to start building this, of course, where you get rid of all your, um, your process color. And again, here I'm at the red, and I can go to select, same, fill color, and I can add rainbow to the head. So is there a stroke on the chicken, too? No, there's no stroke on the chicken. What there is, is this whole body that's in black. Clip art's weird. Our perception is it's a stroke, but that's not how they set it up. So you have to start, when I get a um, stock vector image, I do what I did first. I start picking the pieces off to see how they built it, so I know where my trouble areas are. I'll show you a huge trouble area in this assignment. Um, all right, let me, let me select everything that's black. So everything that's black, go to select, same, fill color. You can also group things. So I've now selected everything black, and I can go to object, um, group. And so now everything black is grouped. But now it has to be on the same level, which is why that caused a problem. And because the wing was on top of the body, and the thing that looked like the black outline was behind the body, so grouping it, put it on the same level. So that wasn't a very successful move. So I'm going to go to Command Z and undo it. So it's not grouped. But now I can still universally change the color um, there for the chicken. And again, I can go to separation preview. And what used to be only process color is now process color and red and green. So I can turn off the red through the eye and turn off the green and see where my trouble areas are to fix this. These are called color separations. Separations, color separations are essentially showing you what the printing plate is that's going to generate that graphic for you. So again, I can go to the orange here, and notice the orange is only taking care of that one stripe. See this little teeny speck right there where my arrow is? That's where everybody totally misses it. Because if you show all your colors, you will never see that little speck there. But what would happen is, if I don't change that little teeny color in this little corner, because that's the stripe that's behind the chicken, if I don't change it, it's made up of process color. And what that means is, I've built a file that is the red and the green and four other colors to accomplish that teeny speck. And that would cost you, you wouldn't print it that way, but if you did, it would cost you as a six color job instead of a two color job, which would be more expensive. Or your printer is going to say you built your file wrong and you're going to have to fix it. So um, again, let me take the orange, let me um, select object same, fill color, let me just move through this pretty quickly now. Um, let me take the brown, same, um, fill color, did I do that right? Same, fill color, that was it, that's the only brown. And um, and then you know you'll you'll have fun. It's actually a lot of fun. Working in Illustrator is a lot of fun, and I can hold my shift key down and select that whole shape there, and and notice how everything's disappearing because I'm turning it to green. That's why it's disappearing as I'm building it, so I know I've built it right. And this is the sun, the yellow sun, and actually I think what I might do is just make that one um, white. And then the only thing left is the rooster face and the eye. Let's give it a red eye because it got up so early. And, um, and now nothing shows. Nothing shows in my separation preview, but if I put it all back, you can see how I've built this in only two colors. So I recommend checking your work in Illustrator under separation preview first. And now I just save the file. There's two ways to save this document. One is an AI file, which stands for Adobe Illustrator. InDesign loves native files. So I always save my native files when they're going into InDesign as uh, native files. And um, um, you can also save it as an EPS file, which means it can be read, read by other programs than InDesign. So you can also choose to save it as an EPS file. And then you'll get this different dialog box here. And um, what you want to make sure is selected is transparent, because you want the background to be transparent. 
everything that's not the chicken. Um, and you'd say, okay, and it would give you the suffix of EPS, which stands for encapsulated postscript. Now, now we've created this Illustrator file. So now we're in InDesign and we're going to create a new document. It's going to be letter size and you're going to work in two pages, but I'll start by creating one. You're, you will always create a bleed. You will always make your artwork extend to the bleed. And you can set your margin guides to whatever you want. And I think I'm going to set this up as two columns because I'm going to put my text in two columns and create a gutter of larger than a quarter of an inch. And here's my document, which is what you're familiar with. Now, let me just show you the magic here. Look at all of our swatches on the right. Notice that the black stroke is active, so you want to make sure that you don't fall into that problem of stroking something black by accident, remember? So, <clears throat> excuse me, what you want to go to now is go to File, Place, locate the chicken that you created. I, I'm going to use Illustrator. I'm going to open the document. My cursor loads with a graphic and I want to be able to see your whole chicken artwork in this assignment so you can place it in InDesign. But look what happened here. These two swatches automatically got loaded to the swatch, in, the swatch panel in InDesign. So you now know that you've loaded the correct swatches in InDesign and they're found. So you now have your question answer crystal of how do you locate the swatches. You also can locate swatches in um, InDesign by going to New Color Swatch, selecting a color mode, selecting the Pantone Solid Coded library, and it opens that entire library here. And the color type you want to work with is always Spot. However, you're going to change your graphic in Illustrator. You cannot change your Illustrator graphic in InDesign. The colors are all done in Illustrator. So I'm going to hit Cancel because I don't need that. And now I'm going to go to File Place and I'm going to locate the text for the project for page one for the chicken. Oops, that was active. So I hit undo, my cursor loads with the text, and my text is going to fill up this box this much. Now, part of your job is to make it attractive. The other part of your job is probably not to have a headline that says line art. <laughs> you might choose to have a headline that says, um, somebody give me a good headline. Okay. The headline is, Diamond came to school before the rooster crowed. Okay? How'd I do? Is that good? Okay. Now, I also, you know me, I have lots of opinions for you. So, if you type a headline, I mean, that's a perfectly acceptable headline. Remember that the type cannot be in black. It's got to be in one of these spot colors. So we'll make it in red. And we'll make it in uh, impact. And we'll make it large. Am I going too fast for this computer? Yes. Um, what's the deal here? I don't know why it's not letting me go up incrementally, but all right. But typing type in one straight line isn't very attractive to me. So I'd love for you to start thinking of different ways to handle type. You've had beautiful layouts. You've had beautiful layouts in your books. Handle headlines. And maybe what you decide is um, diamond is some different font because it's superstellar. Or you decide that diamond is green and is um, 60 point because diamonds important and then you hit a soft return which is a shift return to break the line and maybe you decided that um, before should be italicized because you want to emphasize it was before the rooster crowed well impact doesn't come in that so maybe you decide that we're in uh, Garamond now and before is an italic and rooster is important and, or not. You decide how to handle it. That looks funny to me. But anyway, you decide how to break up your headlines and make them look interesting. The other thing you can also do now is you might decide to put a background 
behind all of your graphics. So create a rectangle. Um, make sure it, it's not stroked with black. And I can fill it with a tint. And you're going to ask me, you're going to say, Vicki, how come all my tints I created didn't come over into my swatch panel from Illustrator? And the answer is they just don't. Okay? They don't. However, here's the coolest, most wonderful thing that is only available in InDesign. There is something, <coughs> excuse me, in InDesign called mixed swatches, where I can go here to a, a mixed ink group. And I can create by selecting my red and selecting my green increments of these two colors mixed at different percentages. So I can type um, right here, repeat 23 times and repeat this one and give it an increment. So let's say it goes up in 5% increments. And the initial percentage is at 5. So I think probably 20 is too much. Let's just do 10 because you'll see how fast it goes. And I'll do the same thing for here. It's 5. And um, I'll repeat it 10. You know, for some reason I'm clicking and I am not grabbing things today. It's very, very strange. And you can call it, you can name it anything. You might name it 193 to 372 or something for the inks. And I'm trying to get this and it's not working, but anyway. Uh, yeah, let me try and tab. There you go. Good solution. So I'm, I'm not. It's not. It's not letting me tab many places. There. Okay. So let's preview swatches. So what you'll notice here is all of these swatches are mixes of the greens and the reds at different values that I just put in there, and they're numbered. So with that small percentage change, I've created 77 color swatches. And all of these color swatches I created show up in my swatch panel here. So with this background swatch selected, I can take a mix. Let me try and find a light mix of green and red. That's kind of dark, but I'll send it to the back. So that's Command, um, Shift, and left bracket. And I've got this dark background here for my wrister. Notice that um, it also has a transparent background from Illustrator. Um, I can also take this dark background and I can tint that swatch 20% to make it lighter too, right? And in um, InDesign, just like in, in Illustrator, there is an output, it's a different location, it's called Output Separation Preview. And you can view your InDesign document to make sure that you've set it up properly, turn separations on. And I can turn off the red, and I can turn off the green and make sure everything goes away, which it should, but my black text doesn't. So what that means is, as you know, I'm going to select all my black text, and I'll make it either my red or my green color because you're going to want it to be dark. Make sure you don't stroke your text. Never stroke text. Don't stroke text. You might choose to put a stroke on text as a headline, but you'll never stroke text as a body copy. I have so many people who get a photograph and they put their text in black and they stroke it in white so it stands apart from their photograph that's behind it and they just create a nightmare instead. Mm -hmm. I'll show you an example of it at some point. But what you're going to need to do is not just spell check your text here. Now what you might decide to do is take your chicken and you might decide to make the text box much larger and now go to object fitting and um, fill the frame proportionally or fit the, um, fit the content proportionally to the frame. And now my chicken's super large. And then I might choose to go to window and to text wrap with my chicken active and use the text wrap that you're so well versed in. And make sure that you're not doing it around the bounding box of the chicken, but around the chicken itself. And the way to do that is to go to Contour Options and detect the edges of the graphic. So I'm going to the wrap around the shape. Notice in the text wrap, it's the third icon over. And then I'm going to Contour Options, Detect Edges, and now it's wrapping around the shape of the chicken. And I can increase the wrap itself. Yeah? Which creates, if I go to Preview right now, 
is a pretty nice layout, except for these weird random words that break here. So you're going to have to make decisions about that. <coughs> the other thing you can do, which is super great to use, is I can now go to the chicken, I can hold my control button down, and I can go to edit original. And for example, maybe what I decide is I want to select the chicken and its tail, right? I marquee that. And the wing, I'm holding my shift key down, the eye, the face, this part, this part, that part of the chicken. I think I've got it all now. And I'm going to copy it, Command C, copy it. I'm going to create a new document, Command N. Those are all new things you know, I know that. And I'm going to Command V, paste it. And I've got a file now just of my chicken. The advantage of that is I've separated it away from my background. So I'm going to save this and name it Chick. I also know it's the right color mix because it holds the same Pantone colors. Notice they loaded in the new Illustrator file with a chicken. I'm going to save it as Chick um, um, alone so I know what it is. Save it. Say OK. And now I can go back to my InDesign document, for example, and I can um, go to File Place. I can place the chicken alone. I can make it super large. I can go to my flop, my graphic, because it's active. I can move my graphic over here. I can hold my background, I can hold my shift key down, grab my background, and send this chicken and my background to the back. Object arrange, send to back, and deselect my background, grab this chicken again, and go to um, the effects panel, for example, and change it to maybe a 10%. And I've got a hint of the chicken in the background, right? So you can start to have a good time kind of mixing up your stuff here. Um, I kind of like it not really in the way of the text. And then do set your text. Do notice that there's weird and random things here. Do notice there's like a subhead and there's uh, another subhead or headline here. So handle your text appropriately. So you might select your text. Don't use automatic letting. Set your letting yourself. Remember 10, 12 points a type is probably really large. Always change your kerning to optical. Um, and um, then before you finish your project, make sure you've spell checked it, you've proofread it, you've set it up, you've created an interesting layout, an interesting headline, you've opened up the um, window output separation preview panel, and that you've proofed it to make sure you turn off both their eyes um, and nothing should show up on your screen. If something shows up, you have to go back and fix it. Um, and then, the other thing is, is make sure that when you look at your setup, you go to um, the preview with the bleed showing, because you want to make sure that everything bleeds and extends beyond the trim of your page, because I'm going to save my file right now. Here's where it's really important for you to package it. <coughs> right here, save it, um, and of course package it right now. And it's going to tell me that I have two spot colors right here, two spot colors, that's fine. And make sure nothing's missing um, and so forth. The other thing I want to show you is this. There's different ways to display a graphic. Fast display looks like that. And the reason fast display looks like that is so your computer doesn't slow down when it loads a page. It doesn't display all your graphics. Because if you had a catalog and every page had to display pretty for you, it would run really slowly. Um, I don't like it that way. You also can have typical display, which usually makes your chicken look um, with chunky raster edges. But for some reason, it looks really great right now. And high quality display will get rid of the chunky edges to the chicken and refine it so it displays in its optimum view. And, um, and then we've, we're going to package it again, package it. And I'll save it right here. 
and it says don't steal the fonts. We've done that before. And then the next thing I'm going to do is go export it high quality PDF and I'm going to place it in my package folder. And this is the dialog box that becomes really important to you nowadays. You'll always export with this. Marks and bleeds, all printers marks, and here's the key. Document bleed settings. And you must see these numbers in here, um, either an eighth of an inch or a quarter. Otherwise, you've set up your file wrong. Okay? And when I export it, what I'm going to see is this. And um, you want to make sure you see your trim marks, your bleed marks, your color bars, <coughs> and um, dates and so forth. And then how I grade you, let me just show you how I grade you. Oh, this is Acrobat Reader. So I can't show you because Acrobat Reader won't show it. I'll display, I'll, I'll open this in a second. Um, there is something I forgot as part of your instructions um, for this assignment, if we come back here. It asks you um, in this file, I think there's something wrong with this mouse. Every time I scroll or click or something, it's not working. Um, it asks you, where is it? Right here. Not on the score sheet. It asks you to put your name on it, the file format, and what ink colors you used. So that's what I'm looking for. Save your file, create a new document, place it. <clears throat> Be sure add your colors. Your your oh, add to your layout your name, the name of the PMS color used and the file format of the image. So that means in my des in design document, somewhere down here or wherever you want, you know, you can put it wherever, in a spot color, not in black, because you'll have violated your two colors, you'll put that information. So I might put my name, my Pantone colors of, what was it, 2872 and 193. Mm -hmm. And um, I save my file as, my file format of my Illustrator files is AI. Okay? That would be the answer, AI. I don't want to see that you've saved this whole document as a PDF file for me. And then... Um, Can you repeat that, Vicki? You want it submitted as the AI, <laughs> yeah. not as a PDF? No, no, no. You I want do it want it submitted as a PDF, PDF but the file format it wants, it wants to know about. So, okay. sorry, I was talking really fast, wasn't I? I try to talk fast, so I don't... I try to give you as much time, but I know I realize I'm just talking too fast. All right, so... I created the file. I'm typing in black notice, right? The colors I used are PMS 32, no, what was it? 3278 78 and, and PMS 193. Um, and it, to be safe, you could say Illustrator file um, saved as AI. That's really what we're looking for. And then I would take all of my text. Um, I would take all of my text, go to my swatch panel and make sure that I've set this up in a spot color. So again, when I look at it, again, when I preview this um, in separation preview, so window, output, separation preview, I should turn off that spot color and that spot color and everything should vanish. Right? And um, we also see that my artwork extends to the blade. And you've created a far more interesting layout than I have here. So, um, oh, what else was I going to get to? So let me save this file again. Let me show you how I, John and I grade it. We open your document in Acrobat Professional. So we go to File Open. We locate your file as a PDF that you've submitted to us. We're going to look that you have your trim marks. We're going to look that you have your bleed marks. We're going to look that your graphic extends beyond the trim, because that means you've set it up to bleed. We're also going to go to um, Tools, and we go to Print Production. And this is what printers do. It's not just John and I in the world. Printers will look at a PDF file you submit to them, and they'll want to see how you built it. And this is the type of file you would send to a print shop for printing, a PDF with marks and bleeds, printer's marks and bleeds. That's why they're called printer's marks. They register your document 
using these little targets. Those, that's registration. And then what John and I are going to do, we go to Output Preview, which is the equivalent to Separation Preview. And we turn off one color plate. The red disappears. That's your red printing plate. That would be a color separation. And here's your green printing plate. That would be a color separation. Obviously, a printing plate looks like a metal printing plate. It doesn't have color on it. But the red printing plate would have that impression, that image, that text embedded in the printing plate. It's the ink that supplies the color, right? And this is what the green printing plate would look like. And when John and I turn both of these off, we should see nothing. If we see nothing, you already get 60 points in your assignment because you said, I'm sorry, 30 points for one, 30 points for the skunk. Okay? So that was a bucket of information really fast because it's not even 9.30. Um, so are there questions about this? I think when you start doing it, it's going to be really fun. Is that John? Yeah. Are you recording? I am. <laughs> I am, John. We got it to work. I did record it. You're going to have to slow me down. You're going to have to play me on a different speed than the way I talk. Um, oh, we have a puppy again, John. Oh, cool. Zach's got his puppy back there, I think. Unless somebody's... Yeah. Cute. Okay. Um, so are there questions, though? We covered a lot. We covered spot colors, illustrator files, working with graphics. No? All right. Sometimes if I want to do fun layouts with my text, like that hooks and ladder was, I mean, you know how to do it. You can put words in different text boxes. You can, I, I like for you to be creative in these assignments. You know, I can have a little row of chickens running across my page. I can go, um, I can go to edit original. So click on this chicken. Again, go to command, um, I'm sorry, control, hold my button down, go to edit original, and maybe what I decide is I just pick these rays of color right there. Come here, little ray of color. Maybe they're green, that's it. Okay, so I'm going to hold my shift, so I'm going to just make a mess out of this for the moment. And right now I can go to this color, this color, this color, this color, all these rays of color, and, um, and the sun which is white, and copy them, Command C, and close this document before I screw it up, right? Because I've deleted stuff. Don't save. Um, and I just leave that. And paste the sun. And now I've got a sun, right? And I'm going to just save this file as sun. And save it. OK. And I can go back to my InDesign document here with that background tint, for example. And in that background tint, I can place that sun. Now remember this document is a 20% opacity, right? And place the sun file. And it placed it up in the corner here. And I can go to Object Fitting, and I can fill my frame proportionally with that sun graphic. And I've added, yet again, another way of handling my file. I can also go to my uh, direct selection tool and move the contents here down. So keep that background and move my sun so it bleeds off the bottom of the page. And, um, and I, can I can enlarge it. Let's enlarge it to 1200. Because remember, it's resolution independent, so nothing bad's going to happen to this file, right? And I can move the sun so it bleeds both off the top and the bottom. I want it bigger, though. So let's make it 1,500. Hard to imagine. You sure can't do that in Photoshop, make something 1,500% and expect it to look good. Oh, I keep moving the wrong thing, if don't I? If you use object transform and you scale it, I can I can do that also. So once you scale it, let's say you scale it up 120 percent, right? And then you go to transform again. Is yeah. It working from what was 100, or is it now going to transform 120? Oh, it's it's working from where it was. 
it's working from the no it's working from where it is at that minute I think I think that's the answer there's so many ways to do stuff here that um, sometimes I just test it and I see but I want this to bleed off because I don't like there that's kind of what I want so you can see I've got a lot of weird stuff going on here I'm putting my son up in the bottom corner there it is it's rising <laughs> yeah but the idea is have a good time. You know, you finally get to create stuff and explore and create text wraps and so forth. Don't fall into the problem with a text wrap, though, with this one. Don't fall into the problem with a text wrap if I go to Window Text Wraps here and I increase the text wrap. Watch out for when it breaks text poorly and you get these weird, um, so like if I move this in here, you get these lines with like one word. That's bad design. So design and make sure you don't have that. That means that you didn't spend any time looking at it. You just pressed buttons and you weren't proofing your work very carefully. Okay? And you're going to do one page for the chicken, one page for the skunk, and a third page for that score sheet. And then the score sheet, um, you're going to have to type your answers into the score sheet. Okay? So are there any other questions about this? All right, then I'll stop the video and John will post it immediately in Crystal's phone's room.